Do you have trouble finding a house? In this lecture, I'll tell you if sharing is the solution. Will we be forced to share houses in the future? This is the University of the Netherlands. How do you live? On your own or with a partner? Did you buy a house or are you renting? With the ongoing housing crisis, people are both choosing or being forced to share houses more frequently. Be it at roommates or in idyllic communities where people are also working together and are more than just neighbors. In this lecture, I will talk about shared and collaborative housing as a potential option for the future of living. And I will zoom in to pros and cons of sharing by choice or by necessity. Housing systems in many high income economies are broken. Signs of this have been there for over a decade, but few changes have been made in housing policy, in finance or in the building industry. It used to be that owning a house was the way to go. Owning a house was a sign of welfare and being able to provide for yourself. Governments made it easier for people to own their homes through tax benefits. But nowadays, owning is impossible for everyone anymore. Fewer people, especially young people, are able through their own means to secure a mortgage and purchase a home suitable to their needs. At the same time, there is a widespread shortage of houses and a growing demand, especially for rented affordable homes. But building a bunch of extra homes isn't that easy either due to the impact it has on climate, CO2 emissions and material use. Also, we are having quite some trouble figuring out what kind of houses should we build in the first place. In the last decades, we saw a steep increase in the number of people living alone. In cities around the world, one third to a full half of all people live alone, both young and old. That doesn't mean they are loners. Our lives and expectations have changed when it comes to relationships, to forming a couple or having children. And this impacts the kind of houses that we need at different times. Our incomes have failed to keep up with prices of housing. And this impacts the kind of houses that we can afford. Finally, digital technology has made it easier for us to do things at a distance. The last year is a testament to that. But we also realized that physical co-presence is essential to our mental health and well-being. That's why people are more and more sharing housing. With shared housing, I mean when people who do not form a household do live together. This can be in the form of renting an apartment with friends or with strangers or living together in a community. And what follows, let me give you a few examples of what sharing actually means. I will start with co-renting or renting a room in a shared house or building. When you think shared apartment living, we might think of a TV show Friends. Everybody gets along and lives happily together like a student house, but for working people. Friends sharing living space requires quite some negotiation over the use of space, over bills, over cleaning schedules. It also requires a bit of commitment to be emotionally available and connect to others who are not your family. But it also comes with advantages like more affordable living and some degree of flexibility. This sounds good, but newer forms of co-renting hardly fit this idealized image. One example are places like the student hotel, where a person can rent a room from a day to a year with monthly rents at above 800 euros. Quite steep for students who are used to paying three or maybe 400 euros for a room. But price is not the only issue with co-living developments such as these. They also redefine sharing as something quite different from sharing among friends. There is little to no personal relationship among residents that move frequently. And sharing means living in close proximity to branded like-minded others, utilizing the same facilities, gyms or working areas with free internet, but doing that together. While in fact, you might have nothing in common with the people you are sharing with, and you just share because you need a place to live. To ensure like-mindedness, some operators even ask for a CV to access a room, strangely enough. In other words, we moved from friends sharing to strangers sharing. 
the market for co-renting has a less aspirational side to it as well. A sort of underbelly of precarious living at the bottom of the market, where sharing has nothing to do with globetrotting digital nomads and has everything to do with lack of choice. One example are shared tenancies in the UK. Here, a single person on a low income can only claim housing benefit for the rate of a shared room. This means that many times people coming from very difficult situations with histories of homelessness or substance abuse end up sharing with strangers. And this brings them to live in close quarters with other people that they may find dangerous. Women in these situations find it particularly hard to bear, and even though they may be housed, they don't really have a home to go to. What is fascinating about these type of sharing is how little we know about it and how fast they've grown in the last decades all over the world. To give an extreme example, if you ask the Japanese person about sharing in the 2000s, they would be totally unaware of such a possibility. It all started around 2004 with housing called Shea Haosu, modeled after friends. The original ones were targeting foreign residents, since it was expected that only those strange people coming from Western countries would share. But it went from there to 15,000 units around 2010 and 25,000 units around 2018, 2019, and this in Tokyo alone. And it spread from Tokyo to every major city catering to Japanese residents um, in the aspirational trench, where Shea House will provide opportunities to pursue hobbies or even find a life partner, but also in the bottom of the market, where rooms of 10 to 12 meter squares with only half walls in between the units are offered at the cheapest rents. Quick takeaway, sharing living space might have started as a cool alternative way of living for young people, but as more and more of us are pushed into sharing in an inaccessible and unaffordable housing market, we start to see that sharing has quite a few undesirable parts. Co-renting is maybe something that people do out of necessity, but there are also people that deliberately choose to share in a form of collaborative housing or co-housing. Here, people typically have their own house or apartment, but they may own the land together as a cooperative, for example. And they may share gardens, common kitchens and other spaces as a collective. The person in the house next to you isn't simply a neighbor. You invest together in the place, both in terms of money and in terms of time and effort. The people living in collaborative housing have shared values. For example, wanting to own less or live a low impact life. They also value social interaction and community life. One example of environmentally minded collaborative housing are eco villages, where low impact lifestyles paired with low energy housing and circular construction techniques um, create models of what it might mean to live sustainably. These are not just private houses with shared communal spaces, like co-living developments that we discussed earlier. They involve commitment from residents during the whole process, from design to financing to building and then to management and forming a community. The problem with collaborative housing is that it has a very high cost of entry. Self-provisioning or small-scale provisioning relies on people's income and capital in order to start up. Everybody needs to be able to get a mortgage and have the money to build. So especially co-housing tends to be more for the middle or upper middle class. To reduce costs, collaborative housing may require a lot of time commitment from residents, both during development, when residents might lend a hand in a DIY build, and after, by participating in committees, in the general management and maintenance of the place. In other words, if you are at the bottom of the market, looking for a place to live, this form of sharing isn't really accessible. The last example I will give comes from the Netherlands and is a type of housing with shared facilities and activities that has been developed in the social rented sector. It predominantly serves vulnerable groups like status holders, labor migrants, but also students or the elderly. It has both aspects of shared apartments and living in a community. In flex housing, people from different groups rent a room or small apartment, but live together as well. 
it is based on the idea that they self-organize in a sharing spaces and activities. Do you want to organize an event? Go ahead. Start a communal garden? Perfect. The ideal is that people are meant to help each other and learn from each other. Therefore, a basic element of community building is present that makes this different. You don't simply co-rent. You are required to invest time in the community by organizing and engaging in activities. But flex housing is not your typical community-led co-housing either. There are housing associations and social organizations behind these projects that make sure that the community actually functions. They make the rules. So as a tenant, you don't have the same kind of autonomy and decision-making power as you would as a co-housing or cooperative resident. I've studied flex housing provided for status holders, what you would call the very bottom of the market, where at times housing units are little more than remodeled containers. What we found is that flex housing can be successful in providing affordable yet reasonably decent housing that at the same time gives residents uh, an opportunity to form a community. But this is not always the case. What we found is that residents by far benefit from these schemes when they are smaller and more embedded in the neighborhood where they are built, promoting interactions with people outside of the flex housing project as well as within. Finally, these schemes are more successful when they allow residents to share normal everyday activities, like cooking, not just staged events. And this sharing of everyday activities enable friendships to form and social barriers to be broken. So if done properly, flex housing can be a middle sweet spot between collaborative housing with its high entry costs and high commitment expectations and rented shared housing that is more flexible but can also be more exploitative. Nevertheless, it does require a fair amount of social engineering, meaning that it has a high chance of failing, especially at the social part. I started this talk by saying that we are facing a housing crisis and that new forms of housing that try to offer an alternative rely on practices of sharing and collaboration. I've given a few different examples of how shared and collaborative housing is organized and what the potential pros and cons of sharing housing are. So, is more sharing a solution to the current affordability and shortage of housing? The very academic answer to that is, it could be. But it needs to be done properly. Overenthusiasm about sharing and the rosy image of like-minded people forming instant communities when provided with free internet and a gym do not help. If we learned anything from studying shared and collaborative housing, it is that sharing is difficult. As I see it, the ideal way of sharing housing is one where you actually have a choice to share. And you do so in a way that enhances your ability to form connections and live in a community. Will sharing become more common in the future? I would say yes. But let's make sure that if it does, it is not because we are forced into it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.